This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari here at Wild Earth. I'm very sorry for our late start, but here we are eventually in the wilderness together. This is Wild Earth. Hello again. Like I say, I do apologize for our late start this morning. We had some dreadful technical difficulties, which now we have overcome and we are live once more. We're trying to find some wildebeest over there. There they are. They seem to be taking a fairly dim view of our tardiness this morning. My name is James Hendry. Hello. We've got Niels on camera. Hello, Niels. Here is Niels Thumb. And you can talk to us throughout the show using the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. Otherwise, you can use the chat stream on YouTube or Twitch. Otherwise, if you are a youngster, you can get hold of us using the email address kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Let's go back and see if our wildebeest are there. If they are not, we will continue down towards the waterhole in front of our camp where there were lions at 4.45, I'm told. And... Uh, then we'll head further down towards the south and see if we can pick up some tracks of perhaps Tundee the Leopardess, which is my general modus operandi. A never loyal blacksmith lapwing in the foreground there. There we have disappearing wildebeest at Pinder. They have got shining cheetah. Good morning everyone and welcome to And the Unpinder. My name is Damon and behind the camera this morning we've got Marcel and Shining Cheetah indeed. We've been out for quite a while now trying to find this cheetah and it's been quite nerve-wracking. There have been lions roaring all around us. We've seen lion tracks all over this area and so we were fearing for the worst but it seems that she's managed to make it through the night with her and both of her cubs all okay. Look at how alert mom is, sitting up and looking. And we actually drove past this area a little bit earlier. We didn't see, we were on the other side of the bushes behind her there. And I think she was maybe just lying down when we came past, which is why we didn't see her. But there's a herd of impala in the direction that she's looking. And this is the very reason... Oh, um... Let's quickly send you across. I believe we've got lions on a porcupine. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to and Beyond Gala. This early morning, we've got lions killing a porcupine. So there is not that much meat in there. My name is Bunny. I have Owen behind me as a photographer for the morning. He is, we are very excited, after we left the Pride yesterday, drove all the way to the south to try and catch up with them, and just as we found them, they are busy trying to kill this porcupine where there is not that much meat left. The adults are not really too interested in that, they are living and heading down, looks like they are heading towards the water, and majority of the sub-adults are busy nibbling on whatever there is to get on the porcupine. I just see quills everywhere. Quite exciting animal to watch them trying to kill because those quills are nice and sharp. And it took a while because they were trying to find an angle to actually get to the front to be able to catch it. As you can see, just a pile of quills as that male tries to pull them out. But yeah, the amount of meat in that porcupine is not too exciting 
But of course they'll take whatever they can, remembering how hungry they looked yesterday. So looking at how they're looking, they're all not full, but some of them had a little bit of blood, even just before this porcupine. So I think through the night as they walk along, they might have managed to catch something small down on the other side. The porcupine is not really the biggest thing that they can get, but it will fill up a little bit of a gap. Look at how sharp those quills are looking right in the middle of all those lines there. Can hear a little bit of crunch crunch, so one of them has already managed to pull some quills and get a little bit of a flesh there. And here a little bit of growling and a little bit of fight is about to begin. As small as it is, there will be a little bit of a competition amongst them. Because I remember as lovely as they look and how they groom each other. So the lions are not really swallowing the quills themselves. They are pulling them off and trying to get to the little bit of a flesh. If they try to swallow the quills, they will definitely choke, which is one of the reasons why it took them a little bit of time to actually get to kill this porcupine because they needed to chase it and try and loop to the front to be able to get a gap where there is no quill to be able to catch this porcupine from. So of course all the, the other lionesses had a little bit of experience to be able to know that if it was only for the youngsters and if it was left up to them to deal with, there is a chance that some of them would have had some quills stuck in them somewhere. Look at them. Already not that much meat, but a little bit of fight is beginning. So some of them might actually even have quills stuck on them once they're done here. But of course, because they are together and they can groom each other, they will help each other to get rid of those quills for sure. The white young male looks like he's got a little bit of experience. This might not be the first, first porcupine he's fed on. Looking at how he's pulling those quills off and just throw them out and then go back in. Yeah, he's got one stuck on the side of his mouth. Did you see that? He's doing well, but of course quills are quills and they're nice and sharp. So he's going to get some of them. If they just on the side like that one doesn't look like it's gone deep to too too deep so it should be fine he'll be able to scrape scratch it off once he's done feeding right now he's resisting that pain because he wants to be back in there and get whatever he can get yo Bean, yeah, these quills can work as, uh, as toothpicks for sure. They're nice and sharp and they can be able to fit in between the teeth. But they need to be used carefully, similar thing to what we do ourselves when we use toothpicks that we need to be careful not to poke ourselves in the gum. The same things these lines need to be careful of because they... <laughs> cool, look at how bloody is this young male. Of course, there was not that much of a carcass there. But he managed to get himself involved. I think some of the blood he's got will have been poked from the quills. So we're going to link you up now to go view the hyenas while they busy feed. We're going to stay here, watch these lions finish off on this little carcass. Try and follow them when they head down. Looks like they're going to be heading down towards the water hole for a morning drink after this little meal that they had here. Lovely scene here at Juma Game Reserve. Yes, it's Ribbon and yes, it's her two little ones. My name is Lauren. I do have Davi on camera today and we've made our way straight to the den. Spent a lot of time with Ribbon recently, but we wanted to see Corky. That's exactly who we wanted to see. And sadly, there's no sign of her. 
I don't quite know where Corks is. We got a brief glimpse of her little one yesterday, which was so exciting. It's definitely in there. And I don't know if Corky's coming throughout the night to feed. That's a possibility. Only seen Corky at this den once. And the little one inside is far too young to not be with a mother for longer than 24 hours. So I'm not sure I'm going to spend all morning at the den, but I will definitely, definitely keep popping back to see if we can see any signs of Corky. Now, I'm sure many of you are asking about Swazi. For those of you who maybe don't know what I'm referring to, just at the very end of Sunset Drive yesterday, we spotted another hyena who happened to be Swazi, and we were shocked to discover that it had what looked like a snare around its neck. Now, it was loose. Swazi's not going to be hurt, everyone, and the decision will be made today by the Sabi San. So it's been reported, the relevant people are involved, and the decision will be made today. So it was quite late last night, so I promise I will keep you updated. I was hoping to see Swazi, either at the den or in our camp, where he usually hangs out, but I haven't seen him. So I promise you all I will keep you updated to the whatever knowledge I have. But once a decision is made today, they will investigate. The reason it's a tough decision is because not all hyenas survive being darted. There's quite a high chance that once you dart a hyena, they can die. So it's a big decision to take on, and that's what they're going to do today. It was a sad end to a wonderful safari yesterday. After seeing the cub for all of five seconds, it was a slightly sad end to see Swazi like that. But we're on it, I promise. Now, I don't think there's any chance we'll see the little one this morning. It's chilly, it's grey, it's overcast. Corky's little one is definitely, definitely still sleeping. I just don't know why we're not seeing her. And that's why I'm going to keep popping back. I'll go for a little bumble, then I'll come back. Then I will probably bumble again, and then once again return to the den. I really would love to see the little cub come out. We got a brief size comparison yesterday between these two and Corky's little one. And I have to say, it was incredible to see the difference. It's tiny. I put a photo on my Instagram, if any of you didn't manage to see it, and you'll see how young it is. I'm going to go for four weeks. Matt, it's not a, an official statistic, I don't believe. I don't think there's an official figure on survival rates, but going on sort of past evidence, I spoke to Stefan last night, we discussed that hyenas can die from being darted. So it's a decision that, of course, we're not going to make. It has been handed over to the correct body, the savvy sands, and they will, of course, take whatever action they need to take. I find it so peaceful coming here and watching Ribbon being a great mom. She put up with these two jumping on her, jumping on her head yesterday, jumping on her tummy, and she slept right through it all. <laughs> this little pair, these two boys, no no bounds. I wonder if Ribbon's been here most of the night. I would imagine not. She was starting to get more and more awake last night. I'm sure she found some delicious treats. Her belly looks relatively full. morning chorus of birds starting to wake up. The sun is actually starting to break through the clouds up here, Davi. You can see that just off in the distance behind, I think that's a marula. You can see that 
the sun is trying to break through. Hopefully it will burn through all of these clouds. We can get some sunshine. Okay, quickly back to those lions. So they finished the porcupine as small as it was. It was a nice snack for them on the way down towards the water hole. They're now heading down, not too far from the water hole at the moment. But you see how they're all looking up, looking things around. Looks like they're checking. They know that sometimes there's a group of wildebeest, I think, that sticks around in this area. So they're checking it out before they get down because if they get another opportunity, they'll still try to go to try and hunt because that porcupine didn't fill them up. If you look at the adults, they didn't even touch it. It's only the cubs that have got full of blood. Look at this white one, white red face. Look at this guy in particular. It looks like that porcupine's done a great job in poking him. You can see there's a lot of blood there, but he also looks like some of the blood comes from him because he must have jumped into that thing being lacking the experience to hunt. Our friend over here, while he's sleeping, he's managed to keep up the whole night. It looks like he also got a piece or two from from the the thing itself. We're gonna get on with them, loop around to the water hole, which they're not too far from getting there right now. So we're most likely to get to see them drinking, which would be very nice if they do. nothing than the whole pride of lions lining up and drinking in the water all early in the morning. Da Daniela, porcupine is quite a dangerous thing for them to kill and to feed on. As you can see that one young male full of blood all over his paws and chest. At the same time, the experienced one would have had to deal with it before, so they would know exactly what to do to try and avoid getting hurt. So as for the young ones, without the adult's guidance, they, yeah, anything can happen really if they're not careful. If you looked at that, that one young male who has been poked on the chest and all over the arms and is full of blood, that could have gone horribly wrong. The quills could have easily gotten into the eyes, but he lucked out today. But I think the next porcupine is going to feed on. He will be much, much more careful than he was today. So after all, he cleaned himself and having those little puncture wounds from the porcupine quills, it will, he, will be, he will be wiser from now on. He wouldn't be, yeah, he wouldn't rush into it as he would have done today to be able to get all those porcupine quills all over him. Beautiful, eh? They, you see how, as much as they are the kings of the jungle, so to say, they come down into the water hole. They also need to be careful. They can't just right, walk right in. They need to make sure that everything is fine, that there is nothing that could give them trouble. Things like elephants or even other lions because they've covered some serious ground. They haven't been back in this particular section of the water hole at least for or two weeks. The last time we saw them here was about two and a half weeks ago. So they just need to make sure that everything is sorted and they're all just descending down to get down to the water hole. They're going to start drinking. So I'm going to start and loop around so that we can get to get their faces while they drink. It's going to be a little bit of a long distance view, but it will be perfect to be able to see them lined up and maybe even get to hear them. Faithen, lions called king of the jungles because a lot of things are scared of them and they kill to eat. Uh, but of course, they're not really the bosses that everybody is scared of. So elephants are the biggest and they are not scared of lions. But because all the other herbivores are not scared of elephants because elephants don't kill and eat them. 
So lions, technically speaking, have proclaimed to be the king of the jungles because everything else they walk by or everything else that they can find, they will be kill it, kill and they will be able to kill and eat, and that way things are scared of them. So we just got in ourselves around. Oh, I think it's gonna be quite a you a view to get to see all of these lines lined up together after such a distance they've walked from last night all the way to this morning a little bit of nibble every year and there of some things before they got a porcupine they looks like they look like something small earlier on, earlier on but we didn't know what it is but they all not full at all so once they done, confirm the call just go. Ooh, call gone. Did you see that? Yes. So, yeah, look at how some of them are just watching as they drink like that. How beautiful is that scene? Eh? Look at their reflection in the water there as they drink like that. So, what we're going to do now, we'll link you back to Pinda. To see what the cheetahs are doing there at the moment. Did your call also go? Welcome back, everyone. We're still with this mother cheetah and her two youngsters, and like I was saying earlier, I think we're gonna probably spend a bit of time with her this morning, just because of the fact. Remember, yesterday evening we saw her trying to hunt that in Yala. And already she's shown some interest in a herd of impala that, skirt, that kind of skirted um, past on the edge of the thickets in the distance there. And so I think that once she decides to get up and start to hunt, there is a very good chance of us getting to watch another attempted hunt. Now I said earlier that there were quite a few lions in the area. We could hear them roaring in the, not too far from here. And we also saw lots of tracks around. So currently, apparently there are two sub-adult lions that are walking in the direction of these cheetahs. So we're going to keep a careful eye on things. Of course, if they do come into the area, they might be, even though they are young still, they're not fully grown, they might try to chase this cheetah. And just looking at them now, look at how... <laughs> They started to drift off to sleep. I wonder if they didn't have quite a restless night last night. With all the lion activity in the area. Maybe didn't get as much rest in as they could have. And so now taking the opportunity to, to rest in the relative safety of daylight. A time of day when they'll definitely feel a bit more, more comfortable. Just a quintessential scene from from Maputu land. These flat open plains with the thickets all around. The short grass with the dew glistening on it in the morning light. All the different birds calling in the background. So look at her now. She's looking off to the left. That is the direction where... Those two young lions are. And like I said, there's we're gonna keep a careful eye on that area. It is a quite a quite a, a bit of a a clearing between her and the thicket where those lions are. And if they do come out of that thicket and keep heading in this direction, she should have ample opportunity to spot them and to react to the situation. <laughs> I think you'll all agree, she seems pretty relaxed at the moment. Okay, so while we wait for our cheetah family to get up and start to move, let's go and have a look at what the lions are doing over in Gala with Barney. Yeah, apologies for a little bit of technical difficulties as we get down towards this water. All things started going the other way. 
However, some of the lions are still drinking as you can see, but a few of the adults have already been down, had a drink and they look like they're wanting to head back. So looking at the fact when before they come down to the water hole, how they were looking across towards the hill there, they might have spotted something earlier on. So there is a chance that after this they might go, still carry on, it's still nice and cold in the morning, they might still attempt to hunt if they have seen anything. But the weather is just too great for them to finish drinking and sleep right here. So we'll wait for these few other ones to finish drinking and stick around with them and see what they're going to do after this little, this little bit of a bite from the porcupine. Maybe they just gain the appetite that they want to try and hunt more. Look at that young male, the big one, the limping one. He looks like he's not really up to just moving back up the hill right away after drinking. Looks like he's feeling a little bit disappointed. But he's going to have to keep up, unfortunately for him. Because the pride is not going to be slowed down because of his limp. If he wants to lie down, he can. But it means that he's going to lose them. And it might take him a few days to reconnect with them again if he does that. So I think he's got no choice. As bad as we might feel for him. It's what it is. He's going to have to just limp and try and keep up. The consultant the detective saw the lioness with the two cubs is not with the pride. And that the white young male is with the pride, but he was left behind there still finishing whatever was left on the porcupine. So he is around here somewhere. And of course the two rose males are not here. However, the trackers have found for us the tracks of that female with the youngsters. The, she's too far from where this pride is. I don't think she's going to find them in the next day or so unless they head back on that particular direction. As for the rose males, we last saw the pride with them when they headed quite far to the western side of the property two days ago. Nobody knows where they are at the moment. So we will see how it goes. All we know, they could be close to here or they could be very far. Yo, look at how difficult it looks for that young male limping up the hill like that. So Fen, for the age that he is on now, is already around four years old, just over. He should have been out of this pride by now if he had other siblings with him. At the moment, he is sticking around with the pride, and it looks like the Rosmers have made peace. Every now and again, they try and trouble him to chase him off. If he sticks with the pride, if the Rosmers leave him alone, he'll, he's got a fair chance of surviving. But what is going to be difficult for him, it is to become, to grow big and become a dominant male one day. Because most lions that end up holding territories is often coalitions like the two Ross males. Sometimes males could be up to about four or five brothers together. And as for him to try and want to tackle the world by himself to take over a pride one day, that will be a big challenge. I don't know if he will ever live to see that day. But as it is now, he's gone through a lot of difficulties with the Rosmail trying to kill him and yet he still survived. So he's a tough little boy. And he's also been backed up by the females for quite a while. So right now as they go up the hill and you can see majority of them are disappearing except the cubs. We are gonna stick with them and go see what they do. Good morning everyone. It is a beautiful day out here at Swala Kalahari, Jandre and Dylan. Um, it's great having you with us. It is an incredibly windy morning this morning and it's the temperatures are going down again so I think this is really this massive cold front that's moving up in off the southern Cape coast now and it's going to move right across the interior of the country. So I think by the weekend it's going to be bitterly colder. But anyway, to give you some indication of just how windy it's been during the course of the evening. Have a look at these burrows. Now you'll recall very, very clearly just how 
uh, busy the, these mounds of sand were with signs of tracks of these meerkats and, and porcupines and things there's not a mark on them this morning that looks like the surface of the moon eh? and it's um yeah so this wind has just been absolutely howling you can see our little test plot over here that we kept swept with um, to see what tracks moved over it you can you can barely see a trace of anything on you this is that springbuck that had walked over here yesterday those are really the only indentations that you can see so everything else has been swept away so i think we're in for a i think we're in for a rough ride the during the cup next couple of days but it's going to be fun and i hope you join us We're still sitting here watching Snoozy Ribbon and Cubs. I couldn't quite bring myself to Bumbo just yet, but I do want to check Treehouse Dam, which is really not far away from here. So quick, one minute ride down the game path. No, hyenas don't allo suckle. Lions do, lionesses do, but hyenas do not. So especially with Ribbon being the matriarch, there's no way she would let the other one suckle. The other little cubby, I think we need to get little names for them soon, really would only come out properly when mum's here. At four weeks old, hyena cubs only respond to the vocalizations of mom. And it was very interesting sitting here yesterday, hearing Ribbon vocalize, and still the cub didn't respond. Any stations, Bubba? So the minute Corky arrives and calls the cub, the cub will come out, responding directly to mom, and only will suckle from mom. I have mentioned this previously, but there, there are some records of hyenas suckling cubs that are not their own but this is normally the lowest ranking individual who feels she has no choice she'll obviously be lactating she'll have cubs of her own and she feels bullied or under pressure to let the higher ranking hyenas cubs suckle from her but otherwise no we won't find ribbon looking after that little one i'm afraid and that's why we need corky to come we did see Corky with her bottom corked in the den a few days ago, but that's it, just a brief glimpse. Exafa girl, I think that's your name. I actually touched on this earlier, but no, 24 hours would be far too long for that little cub without milk at that age. Uh, Ribbon's cubs, absolutely, but Corky's cub, no. So it's sort of leaving me to speculate that Corky's possibly spending time here at night time when we're not here. I did see Corky with her bottom in that hole two days ago at around just after six in the morning and she immediately got up and left. So I'm wondering if there's a sort of timeshare going on here. Corky's here at night time and Ribbon's here during the day. It's the only explanation I can really think of right now. Because Corky's not seen during the day, which is baffling. Beach Girl, you are new with us. Welcome on board. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. I also love the beach. It's one of my favorite places to be. So Beach Girl, I don't think so. Uh, we've spent a long time at Hyena Dens before. When I first joined, it was a Hyena Den when Corky was actually the matriarch. There was lots of cubs. There was Ribbon's Petty, June's Cubs, Corky's Plonk, Pretty's Cubs. Pretty's no longer with us. And it was a busy, busy communal den. Lots and lots of things happening. And, happening sorry. and I really don't think Corky would avoid coming here because she's lower ranked. We don't actually know where she sits on the hierarchy of five, but we know it's definitely not at the top anymore. So I can't see why that would affect her movements. As long as she acts submissive to Ribbon, Ribbon will accept her. 
But again, it's just the only sort of plausible explanation that I can come up with right now as to why we're not seeing Corky. A few of you have asked, is it definitely Corky's cub? And yes, Corky's the one that's been seen with this cub when it was very first discovered. And Corky's definitely lactating. I really thought Hart was possibly lactating at one point too, and we would eventually see Hart here with Ribbon as they have quite a close friendship, a close relationship. But no signs of Hart, I'm afraid. Hyenas form alliances. There's a scientific paper from last year, yep, 2019, and it's incredible. It's all about the friendships and hyenas. <laughs> it's just the keys, it's okay. It's just the noisy keys. Sorry, Bex, one more time with that question. I got distracted by those birds in the sky that complete... Oh, that's a cub. Cutie? Kiki. Kiki. Kiki the cutie. Kiki, sorry. Animosity? I think not. I really don't. One Sayuna's sort of... Well, they got through their tough time, they established a rank, they still need one another as a clan. Remember, hyenas have a matriarchal female-dominated society. It's all about the females. Ribbon couldn't survive without her females around her. And therefore, animosity, I think not. I really don't. But if Corky was to over overstep the mark and start to act a little bit dominant again, Ribbon would absolutely put her in her place. Taylor made, you're asking, would there be any animosity between the cubs? I'm assuming you mean Ribbon's cubs versus Corky's little one. And again, absolutely not. No, I don't think animosity is the right word to use when you're referring to hyenas. The Ribbon's doing what most new mothers do right now. She licks the rear end of the cub and it helps with stimulating digestion. That's very, very normal. Yes, the cubs will not, the cubs learn from mother. So they're born with the silver spoon effect, which is when you're born with the rank that your mother gives you. So these cubs right now, these two boys will be very high ranking and they will know it. They will know this because they're learning their behavior from mum. How mum acts is how they will act. So Corky's little one, I assume, will behave very submissively, submissively to ribbon and submissively to these two boys. So animosity, definitely not. They will wrestle, they will tumble, they will fight, bite and play. But animosity, no. Corky's little one really, really should be submissive to them. It looks rather bizarre what Ribbon's doing right now, but it's really, really normal with mothers. They just help stimulate the little one's digestion by giving the rear end a clean. Okay, I think we're going to bumble around Treehouse Dam and then eventually come back and see if Corky makes an appearance. Welcome back, everyone. It seems you've joined us just in time. It looks like this mother cheetah is starting to show some signs of waking up. We often seen with lions and leopards how they start to groom themselves and roll around and yawn when they're getting ready to get active. It's much the same with these cheetah. Look at how that female is busy grooming her shoulder with her tongue. Look at the two, the two cubs, muzzle to muzzle. And a few moments ago, 
mom and her little daughter were grooming each other's faces, helping to clean off any dirt, maybe even lick off some of the morning dew. Look at how shiny the grass is. Lots and lots of morning dew. Lots of moisture on the ground. Mum giving herself a very good clean. Using those big spikes on her tongue, almost like a comb, to brush through her fur. <laughs> Shame, look at the two cubs, look at their backs, look at how hunched over they are. And how their tails are wrapped around their bodies. Not as cold as it was yesterday, but there's still a bit of a chilly breeze blowing in from the west. And I'm really hoping that... Oh, look. Look at the cubs grooming each other. Oh, look at that. That is so cute. Just shows the incredible bond that exists between these, these siblings. And between their mother and them. Oh, here we go. Here's a little stretch from the little female. Look how long that tail is. And look at how flat it is. We've spoken before about the importance of a cheetah's tail and how when running at high speed that tail comes in handy helping them to steer and once again it seems to be the little female that's the first to start moving around she's looking in the direction of where those lines were a little bit earlier Bonnie you're asking if the weather will affect animals moods Bonnie, it's difficult to tell. I'm not sure that I could tell an animal's mood <laughs> in terms of being happy, sad, or anything like that, but it certainly affects their behavior, Bonnie. So, um, for example, on a, on a colder day like this morning, these cheetah have stayed huddled. They've been lying in the sun and warming up for a bit. Perhaps if it was an, a, a, a warmer morning, um, they would already be walking around by now, hunting a bit more, and if it was on the extreme flip side of that, if it was very hot in the middle of the day, they wouldn't be lying out here in the open under the sun. They'd probably go into some shade. If it was also exceedingly hot, it also might discourage predators like this cheetah from hunting to a certain extent. Although we've said before that female cheetah, especially when they've got youngsters and they're trying their very best to avoid competition with with other predators, will often hunt at obscene hours of the day when it's very hot, in the middle of the day, just to avoid the competition. Oh, look, there's a stalk going on. Isn't that just too precious? Come on, Mum. It's time to go. And it's incredible to see, I don't know if you remember from a couple of days ago or two days ago or so when Dumi was filming these cheetah and how fat their tummies were. Look at their bellies now. It's been about 48 hours and look at that little female's tummy. It's not empty empty just yet, but definitely looks like they could do with a meal. And that's exactly why we want to be with these cheetah this morning because I'm pretty sure that mum is going to get, get going soon. And in these clearings, like we've already seen, there's a lot of impala and even in the thickets around us, some inyalas. So we're going to stick with her and hopefully she manages to find something to eat this morning. Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. So we left the water hole as indicated earlier that it looks like the older lionesses must have spotted something up here. So they walked up the hill and they spotted there's a head of impala. It's a little bit out of sight because we don't want to move around and disturb their hunt. So all the adult lionesses, two has gone to the right and two has gone to the left and they're doing what we called during Shagazulu's time, it would have been called the horns of the buffalo. And the horns of the buffalo, technically, does mean that 
these lines are looping around, going out, and they will bring it back in to try and chase these impalas or wildebeest towards the center of the group. So these few individuals that we have waiting here, it's only the youngsters that are inexperienced, that are supposed to sit tight. However, this one with the full of blood and this young white one, they keep on moving forward. Remember what I mentioned yesterday about the white one running hands? That might just happen now because she's being inquisitive and she's moving way more forward than she's supposed to. And if the impalas see and the wildebeest sees her, they will know for sure that something is going on. So as for us, we're sitting tight here, we're waiting and listening to hear if the impala starts running or start giving a distress call, we watch to see which lionesses are going to bolt and that's when we're going to start and take off to go get involved and see what goes on. Right now, we don't want to move an inch because we don't want to get involved in this hunt. We don't want to run it for them or we don't want to chase those impalas towards these lines because that will be unfair on either side if should we do anything. So for now, the other thing that might ruin this hunt, the white one, the white male that we said that he was missing, he was left behind finishing up on whatever was left from that. So he was left behind finishing on the porcupine. Now we can hear him contact calling, so he's making a noise that might give our position away. So we're going to link you to go see some impalas in the time being while we wait. Hopefully by the time you come back here, the action will be on. Slightly more gentle scene playing out here on the eastern fringes of Juma. A mixed herd of herbivores, impala and nyala. With a crested franklin and now a Swainson's frank, uh, spur fowl shouting nearby. Very peaceful. It's warming up a bit. Not that it was very cold this morning. And we have heard and seen very little evidence of the predators we seek. In fact, no evidence whatsoever. Here, buffalo. Just round the corner here. Perchance they are being set upon by the Nguhuma pride, but most likely not. That is, I don't know why Nyala horn doesn't twist like a kudu's. I think the twisting of the horns probably began with a common ancestor a couple hundred or couple ten million years ago, so sort of twenty million years ago plus minus, and that common ancestor then speciated into what eventually became Nyala bushbuck and kudu, the tragalaphids. And or spiral horned antelopes, which include the bongo and the mountain nyala and the lesser kudu and uh, the eelunt. And each of them just had a different kind of curled horn. And I think what you'll probably find is that there's not a great deal of advantage to the curly horns other than for the purposes of display. And therefore, their curliness was driven by sexual selection rather than natural selection. And so you end up with slightly different designs. I hope that's a useful explanation to you. If it's not, let me know. And I shall attempt to explain a bit more uh, or in greater detail. But it's important to understand that a lot of what we see out here are or a lot of the characteristics of animals and plants and that we see out here are not necessarily born of natural selection. In other words, 
they don't necessarily confer some sort of sec uh, selective advantage on the animal in question. And again, as I like to point out quite frequently, the great example is that of the peacock's tail, which doesn't necessarily doesn't actually give it an an advantage other than to attract females. And so it's been driven, its design has been driven not by an increase in survival rate, but an increase in mating ability or sexual selection. I'm afraid, Daisy, I'm going to have to have your question again because I don't understand it. Let's have it again. You say you see that all the antelope have horns, but why don't female have sat females have horns? So Daisy, I think you'll probably find that most female antelope don't have horns and it's unusual for them to have horns. Now, it's a good question though, the one that you've asked. You'll find that species in which the females have horns, we think have horns for two, one or two reasons. One is that they use the horns for defense against predators. Chemspok or oryx is probably a good example of that. Whereas the horns for something like an impala or a nyala are used for display and for fighting each other and not for defense. The other thing is that there seems to be some evidence that in species like wildebeest and topi, the female horns confuse the adult bulls into believing that the sub-adult males are females. I hope I'm getting this right. Sub-adult males are females and they leave them alone. They don't harass them and perhaps kill them as a result, you know, as they come into puberty. And so there seems to be in those species like um, topi, wildebeest, some kind of protective advantage conferred on the offspring of the female by the females having horns. It's a tricky one to understand, probably even trickier to prove, but there seems to be some evidence for it. But most of the ten species we get here don't have horns. So the wildebeers do, the females have horns, but in the impala, the three tragalaphid species, the diker, the stiernbok, the one sable we've seen, uh, no, in fact, sable, do sable females have horns? Yes, they do. Sable females do have horns. So, you know, most don't, but some do. Right, let's move on from here because I can hear these buffaloes. I don't know how close they are, but let's just go and see that the Inkuhuma pride is not setting upon them. Let's go back to Barney, whose lions are definitely on the hunt. So these lions have attempted this hunt, messed it up. So now from all the different positions that they've headed towards when they were chasing, they're starting to reunite. Look at how what they're doing there. Just after the few minutes of splitting up when they were trying to chase, now they're grooming each other. So it looks like they, this particular hunt is done. It looks like they might just settle down here for the morning so we're gonna see look at that that mother is not happy the boy is trying to get a little bit of a, a groom and trying to say hello but the mother is just not too excited so what happened is that some of the older female as they were going around trying to get into the front position these cubs walked right into the open towards those impalas and wildebeest and those animals just took off of course this young male the white one wasn't there for the hunt but he's also getting the same cold shoulder from the mother 
because they had just a nibble of the porcupine, the young ones and the mothers didn't get anything. And now they just messed up that hunt. But like I said yesterday, at the age that they are on, they will ruin more hunts because they're inquisitive and they're feeling the need to start participating just so that they can gain the experience. But experience for them doesn't come easy. They have to be up and about and doing these things with the adults. In which case, later on it's going to pay off. But right now when they're really hungry, when the young ones mess it up, it's not the nicest thing for them to see. So some of the adult lionesses have still disappeared behind the bushes. But it didn't sound like any of them caught anything. They chased in all different directions, but altogether it looks like they're all missed. So we want to stick with this ones here now and see when the rest of them starts coming back. So for those that said earlier that the young male was missing, there he's back now with everybody. With yeah, just a few that's here for now. He's already gone down, had his drink, and now he's joined the club. See, they're starting to groom and clean themselves after that blood from a porcupine. The ones, the ones that are cleaning now don't have too much blood. The ones with a lot of blood seem not to worry much about starting that process yet. But let's stick around and see how long it's going to take him to start cleaning himself. Now, before we get into the buffalo that we're looking at now, I must tell you that uh, you can ignore absolutely everything that I said about the curled horns because Douglas Ross has, in fact, dispelled all the theories I came up with. Thank you, Douglas, for that. Douglas has explained, of course, that the reason kudu have got curlier horns is that they drink more wine and therefore require a more corkscrew-like set of horns. Of course, I don't know why I didn't think of that myself. Thank you very much, Douglas. Here we have found our buffalo herd, but we have not, as yet, managed to find the Nguhuma pride, and I don't think the Nguhuma pride is about to jump on the backs of one of these buffalo, on account of the fact that they are peacefully grazing towards the east. It's very nice to have them back again. And for those of you who are perhaps new viewers, we went a long time without having any buffalo around here because of the drought. Let me sneak slightly forward there, Niels. It might give us a bit of a better picture. I think it's more than just the bottom. Oh, okay, we'll just head up into the middle of the herd here. Welcome back, everybody. So this mother cheetah has just had an attempt at trying to catch some impala, and the cubs tried to get involved as well. They ran one way, mom ran the other way. Now the cubs are running over there. Mom's calling from there. Let's go try and catch up. Never a dull moment with these cheetah. I can just hear, there's a wildebeest over there. Grace, you're asking how fast can a cheetah run? Grace, if it can get a, a chance to run in a straight line at its absolute fastest, it can run more than 100 kilometers an hour, which is about 60 miles an hour. Ooh, where did you go, cheetah? So this is where the calls were coming from. Got to look carefully. There's the wildebeest. Oh, and my soul is just spotted. Oh, yeah, the cubs, the cubs are in the road. There we are. So I'm pretty sure that mom is nearby. Here's the other cub. Oh, 
and they're back in the road. There's a big chase going on here, they're playing. Oh, let's catch up. It's gonna stop there. Ziggy, you're asking if these cheetah cubs will be faster than an adult lion. Ziggy, at this age, no, they're not. Um, they're still growing, they're still developing their muscles. And so at this age, they would be very vulnerable to... Look at them coming towards us! <laughs> Do you see that little skid who kicked up some sand? Ziggy, at this age, if a lion were to get close enough to charge at them, they would be in trouble. So that, for that reason, mom will need to... Make sure that the lion doesn't get um, close, doesn't get close to them while they're resting. There they go. Oh, they're going into some very thick bush. Oh, they're coming back onto the road, but we're having a bit of a tough time trying to keep up with them for now, everybody. So let's, in the meantime, send you across to James with his buffalo, and we'll call you back once we've got them. Righty, we are still sitting with our buffalo. They are not hunting anything. They are not being hunted by anything. They're just enjoying their vast presence, individually and collectively. By that I mean the buffalo. Not us, if you know what I mean. Sorry, just let me have that, have that again, Fulton. Could a hippo suddenly do what? Exactly? I'm afraid my radio is breaking up, Fulton. You want, you're a new viewer and wondering if a hippo would suddenly dash forward and do something or other, which I can't copy. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's uh, difficult to answer the question not knowing what it is, but I'll have a go. Oh, at, would it attack a buffalo? No, it's very unlikely that a hippo would attack a buffalo. Definitely not in this kind of situation, unless it was rabid, and that's a joke. So I think you'll probably find that a hippo could attack a buffalo if there was competition over water and the hippo thought that the buffalo was going to keep it from the water, then it's possible that the hippo might attack the buffalo. But otherwise, I think it's very, very unlikely that a hippo would ever attack a buffalo. So in this situation, when we're away from water, it's just not going to happen. The Dirk, you want to know why they've got that thick helmet on their horns? You'll find that it's largely only the bulls that have that. And the reason they have it is that they bash their heads together with each other and so they need extra protection. So if you look at that, can you zoom in as close as you can to the one on the left there? Thanks, Niels. There's a cow and you can see she doesn't really have a helmet. She's just got the horns coming out of her head. There we are. Whereas the bulls have got the big boss or helmet there, and that's because they fight each other by bashing their heads against one another. And that necessitates the need for a helmet. Otherwise, you'll get concussion and eventually all sorts of other dreadful brain traumas from concussive or progressive concussive injuries.
you can hear now that oxpeckers have suddenly got it in their heads that they need to move around. And you can hear them zitting and buzzing at each other, I suppose. Clicking. Zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
iconic pair that we always see. I'm pretty sure this is one of the pair. And the juvenile that we get to see around is the offspring of this pair. They are monogamous, which makes it very easy for them. Monogamous, monogamous birds don't have to spend energy advertising themselves or getting a breeding plumage or calling constantly to say, I'm the one, <laughs> pick me. They don't have to do any of that. Once they find their other half, they can mate for life. But when you use the word monogamy in birds, it doesn't always refer to for life as humans like to see it. It can be just monogamous for one breeding season. It can be monogamous for multiple breeding seasons or it can be a pair bond for the rest of their life. It obviously benefits battleers and many birds of prey to just keep their mate by their side. They can save energy that way and focus more on parental, parental care and hunting. Yay, Viet. Yay, Viet. I hope I got that name right. <laughs> this is a bird of prey, so they are the predators, the aerial predators of the sky, but other much larger birds of prey could attack a battalier, especially a juvenile battalier. They're much smaller, and of course, they will be weaker. So the likes of a martial eagle, for example, really could attack a juvenile battalier. I'm not entirely sure about the adults, so they're very, very big birds. I'm just going to check my bird app for exactly how much they weigh. They weigh 2.25 kilograms. And they're just over half a meter tall. So they're large birds. And I'm really, really not sure if the likes of a martial eagle or any other type of eagle would go for the adults, but they really would go for the juveniles. The juveniles would be an easy target for big birds of prey. We had a martial eagle just the other day on Chitra, so I'm hoping we can find it again. It's absolutely beautiful. Kiki, you're asking about the feathers. I think I'm having a little bit of trouble with my combs today, but down feathers? Yes, all birds have down feathers, so they have a whole range of different types of feathers. When we use the word plumage or feathers, it's not referring to one single type. It's actually referring to a whole range of feathers that birds have that are, have evolved for different purposes. So birds will have flight feathers, they'll have insulation feathers, known as the down feathers. And this is to help keep them warm. They're not as rigid, they're not as structured, and they'll be very, very soft. Some pillows are made from down feathers. And this is normally around their chest area to keep them nice and warm when it's cold, especially those internal organs like the heart and the lungs that they need to make sure they're nice and warm. So the down feathers are normally around the chest and then you have different feathers on the wings as well to allow for flight. But yes, all birds will have down feathers, mostly on their chest. So I think we are going to keep moving on in case there is a female leopard in the area. There could possibly be... The tracks looked relatively fresh and there was light rain around here this morning. Really, really not heavy, not enough to soak the ground, but the ground is damp. So when an animal walks on that, you can really tell from the track how fresh it is. And I think these female tracks were quite fresh. So I'm just gonna check the area to make sure that no one is moving around here. Apparently Tandy and Sabui were seen in the same area yesterday. Very, very similar areas. Their territories border one another. And there was a little bit of concern for Sabui a few weeks ago, but she's absolutely fine. And she was seen yesterday. A few of you were asking me, we didn't see her though, but she was sighted by other vehicles. A 
and James and I both have a gut feeling that Tandy and Cub are sitting somewhere on Juma. Wouldn't it just be delightful if we could see them? So I'm going to do a quick loop and then I will head back to the hyena den to check. Has Corky made an appearance or is it still just going to be Rib Robs and her too? Lots of hyena tracks as to be expected. But I did want to mention one thing with regards to Shadulu. I think Davi and James got very lucky with Shadulu yesterday. She's pushing much further east than she ever has. Miss Shadulu is going to be the most dominant female around here soon, I think. Klalamba is territorial now, but we're still trying to establish her territory. But I think Shadulu is pushing further and further in. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick loop here and then I will head back to that wonderful hyena den. So, <clears throat> majority of these lines have managed to regroup and they all lying down, but still few members missing. So every now and again we hear some contact calling. Some of these cubs have been responding back to the contact call itself. It's still a very low tone call, so she mustn't be, they're not too far. So this, I think this is it. They might regroup and lie. Of course, it's still nice and cloudy. But after missing that hunt, it doesn't look like they've got more energy to carry on going anywhere. So chances are that they're not going to move too much from here from now on. All the young ones are already cleaning themselves and getting rid of that blood from a porcupine. And it looks like they might lie around here. Of course, the weather is still quite good, nice and cloudy. And being close to the waterhole like this, there is a chance that they might see something that might attempt them, that maybe they can give it a second attempt. Just gonna wait, check and wait with them for a little while long until they completely lie down. Once they lie down, we're most likely to leave them, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're not here this afternoon. Because majority of the animals that come down to drink on the same water hole where they drank earlier, some of them might have to walk past here where they're lying down. A lot of game paths going down towards the water hole here, so these animals are going to have a little bit of a hard time if these lions are sleeping here to get themselves down into towards that water hole. So some of the other lionesses look like they're already closing their eyes and ready to go onto the side. But the sub adults are still quite active. Some of them have walked down towards the, looks like towards they're going towards the water hole, but I think they might just be meeting up with the other member of the pride who has been contact calling for the last while. Look at the adult lioness on the back next to those cubs that are grooming. Look at how she's breathing. It's taken her, it has been like 20 meters, minutes already after she chased and missed, but she hasn't recovered fully. You can see how she's still panting. That goes to show that as powerful as these animals are, they're not fit at all. So after just that little sprint of was less than 200 meters, of course, and she realized that the game is over, she stopped and walked around to join up with everybody else, but she's still painting quite heavily. Every now and again she picks the head up like that. I think it's because of the contact call from the rest of them from further down. But she hasn't moved much. It looks like she's soon gonna go flat onto the side just to rest proper. Pretend it all depends, but lions are very famous for sleeping for a seriously long time. Lions sometimes can sleep between 16 and 18 hours a day. But that all depends on the weather of the day, how hungry they are, the area that they are on. Because some places, even if they're still trying to sleep, because they're opportunistic, if an animal that they think they, can, they might be able to hunt and successfully kill comes by, they will wake up and give that a go but they really sleep for a seriously long time. 
But this pride, the last few days, I think they have slept way less than that, looking at the distance that they've been covering. So at some stage, they will sleep and try and cover and yeah, catch up with all that sleep. So today, if they are still here in the afternoon, maybe if nothing disturbs them, they might do that. But with a nice cloudy weather like this, I doubt that today will be that day. I think they're going to get... <laughs> Looks like something's caught their attention. Got up and look. Decides that maybe sleeping is not the greatest thing for her right now. I don't see what she is seeing, but she's definitely seen something that's caught her attention. Look at how focused she is. Can hear a pearl spotted owl calling in the background. While we look at her, carry on to look at what has caught her attention. The others are also looking up and looking in the same direction she's been looking. Is taking a careful look. The direction she's looking at, I see some other pride members standing there and looking this way. I don't know if that blood is still from the porcupine, but the one that's popping the head behind the bush there looks like it's still full of blood. But I think it might still be from a porcupine. It's one of the young ones that were possibly feeding on that porcupine area on. exciting times we hear some guinea fowl distress calling further up on a distance that could still be what is caught this lioness's attention to see what is spooking those guinea fowls on a distance lisa these lines are of course in great great condition so they're not really looking too full, but they look like they've been getting bits and pieces here and there to keep themselves going. And they yeah, are 100%. Their coat is looking nice and clean. And they are really, really good looking lines as it is. So they are in great condition. Oh, look at this lioness that have just walked and decided to come lie right next to us, which does become slightly uncomfortable. She's looking a little bit up, looks like she's giving Owen a little bit of a personal look right there. But I don't think she's going to stay there for too long. She might get up and carry on moving. Great, great camouflage they have. Eh? She's lying right next to the vehicle, but if you look at the color of the grass on the background, you could easily miss her. Eh? There are some few individuals, which is possibly what caught their attention either that are slowly again coming back, that they haven't rejoined with the rest of the pride. It looks like she's now seen all of them and she's coming to join. Zach, the whole pride is lying all over around us at the moment. They just haven't grouped up together and lie on the same spot like they usually do, or almost lie on top of each other. But when they were trying to hunt earlier on, of course, they need to split up and go separate ways to try and circle their prey so that they can block it and catch it that way. And after the hunt, sometimes most of them will regroup quite easily, but few individuals might take a while. So this lioness next to us is part of the pride, and there are pride members all over around us as we speak. So they're slowly but surely regrouping, and looks like they're eventually going to be on the same spot all together. But right now they're still scattered all over this area and just lying down and taking it easy. The ones that were slightly further up is the one that was contact calling. I don't know if you saw this one that just walked past us. Looks like was the one that has been contact calling for the last while. Now has joined with, the rest, with most of them.
see another one there coming to join. It's the boy that <laughs> possibly still feeling a little bit of pain from killing that porcupine, looking at how much blood he's got. But he has not taken his time to clean himself. He is just joined up with the rest. Grooming the sister there. It looks like he's hoping for a little bit of a groom back from the sister. Maybe help him clean that little bit of blood that he's got. Look at how he's walking past all of them. Here comes the white boy. Also joining the party. So slowly but surely it does look like all of them will come to this area together. Though this area where they are on the south southeast of the property, it's a part of their territory that overlap with another pride that comes from Manieleti. That comes in and out, I think. It is just an extended bit of that particular pride. I haven't seen them in this section in a while, so they every now and again we see another pride, but it's not, we don't see that pride as often as we see this pride. So lion prides, as territorial as they are, every now and again the territories overlap and this is the section where the two prides territory overlaps Megan, <laughs> they, right now they do look like they're social distancing, but they will group up again. They normally lie on top of each other. I don't think they know that they need to social distance, Megan. I don't think that COVID has, is part of their life as yet. But at least it's a good thing that you're thinking about it. So I hope you are social distancing yourself. And it's the new normal that we need to live like that. But maybe it will catch up with these lines at some stage, but we hope not. But yeah, you're 100% right. Right now, they're giving each other a little bit of a distance. <laughs> not like you normally do when they lie on top of each other. Let's see how long it takes them out while they keep their social distance, how long they take before they regroup and lie on top of each other as they usually do. I'm going to sit with them for a little longer and see how long that lasts. So we've had one very, very, very brief glimpse of the meerkat. Just a single animal popped its head out, literally, just the head, looked around and said, goof, there's no ways. So it's not been hugely productive here today. And with this, this wind that's been blowing now, I think it's unlikely that the pups would actually be coming out of the burrows in these temperatures with this wind. Um, anyway, let's see what happens. I think it's just still going to be worth spending time here, uh, regardless. Um, you never know what, what rocks up here. There were five cheetah in the area yesterday, so we are just keeping our eyes open, scanning this immediate, you know, the, this field of view that we can see over here. Unfortunately, as you can see from these burrows here, tracks are going to be an absolute nightmare. Um, today to try find anything um, but that's not going to stop us trying and that I think that's the important part um, so yeah it's quite nippy out here today so I hope all of you are tucked up somewhere warm or whatever you're doing that you're staying nice and warm um, but the forecast is actually for 29 degrees today so maybe this wind will die down a little bit and if it gets to 29 degrees today it's going to be a, that's going to be a warm day out here certainly for this time of the year um, and um, and even this morning because of this wind normally we have a couple of birds flitting around in these bushes and there's nothing going on this morning Jordan five years old that's an amazing question and thank you thank you thank you for asking it Jordan has just asked do termites have predators? And 
we've got some amazing animals here that feed on termites and termites are critically important for the very survival of these animals things like um, uh, pangolins uh, art fark and then a beautiful animal that I'm still trying to find for you called an art wolf termites are critically critically important for the survival of these animals um, those are the larger ones and then of course you get a whole range of other species that also feed on termites you get spiders that that, that occur here that only prey on termites it's it's the only prey item that they will eat um, birds especially when you got uh, birds around with with chicks if they got babies those termites are a critically important food source for them so we're going to cut to Ngala quickly we've got something really good there for you <laughs> as indicated earlier that the airlines are right on the path down to the waterhole so the first thing that came down came up now looking like it's going to disturb their peace is not what they were hoping for because i think they will possibly will be hoping for something small that they will be able to catch but there is a big elephant bull standing over there which they've already seen and this is why they see that their heads up already and looking that way i don't know if the elephant knows about them as yet Susan, elephants are not afraid of lions at all, in particular when they're fully grown and as big as this bull is. So, of course, if they are in the head, it's not a single bull, that's actually two big bulls together, Susan. And if they see these lions, yo, this one bull's tusk is not tiny at all. If they see these lions, they're definitely going to try and chase them around. So the lions are going to have to run and get out of here and go hide somewhere. But I don't think the elephants know as yet that there is lions that are lying here. So it will be interesting to see. And your question will be answered. If this elephant sees these lions, how quickly they're going to come towards them and try and chase them off this area, Susan. But that big bull is just strolling past slowly. At this moment in time, he's only thinking about drinking. He doesn't even know that the lions are here. But for his size... He's got absolutely nothing to worry about in this, in this particular situation. You can hear the bushes cracking. One of them is just walking straight through the bushes as he comes down. There's a lioness that's not too far in front of our vehicle that that elephant is walking straight towards. The lioness's head is already up and looking in the direction to see what the elephant is gonna do so let's also find out for ourselves mm -hmm. Yo, looks like that elephant has just seen that lioness as you can see how the head has been held up high ears opening up that's a threatening gesture the elephant is trying to make himself look as big as possible there is no use to do that you're big enough but then he's most likely to start taking a few steps forward towards that line i think he's just even if he hasn't confirmed with his eyes exactly where this line is he might have picked up the sand of these lines already remember the sand will be really really strong because they just just had something bloody which was the porcupine earlier on today and elephant's sense of smell it's excellent that if one of those lions have walked past their area on when they were trying to hunt you will pick that up right away looks like quite an old bull as well if you look at the indentations in front of his face they're quite sunken in so he's not a young elephant at all and then he goes forward, look at his tail, tail going onto the side, sign of being aggressive already. And the lioness get up and want to get out of the way. He has just confirmed with his eyes that there's a line down here. Look at how he's staring this line down and watching every single step that this lioness is taking towards the rest of the pride. And he decides. 
said, did you know by just that you can tell the mood of the elephant by just looking at the tail? Right now, I don't know if you saw the tail was going straight parallel to the body. Kiki, they might want to, but I will not allow them to do so because I don't want to be part of this little problem that's about to happen here. If this elephant takes few steps forward and start chasing them, I'm going to start the vehicle and go stay clear and just watch this whole commotion from a distance. Because remember, elephant is a big mammal, bigger than we are, possibly much more heavier than this vehicle is. If he's trying to get to the lines and we see sitting in between, if he decides to push us over, it's going to be a bigger problem than we actually want to have. So I will not let them. Looks like the elephant is standing there, just tearing the lines down, deciding what his next best move will be. Look at that trunk slightly going up from the ground, sniffing and slowly pointing up towards the, pointing it towards the direction of these lines. Crystal, yeah, he's a really big bull, but there's a bull that's slightly bigger than he is coming from the background. He, yeah, only has one task. I don't know how he would have lost his task. It could have been on a fight with another bull. It could have been when he was feeding and maybe digging for things on the ground. It could have been when he tried to strip the bark of the trees to be able to feed on. But he is really a big bull. But like we mentioned yesterday morning, that the task doesn't really grow back once it's broken. So the tiny bit that's there, if his tusks are still to grow, might carry on growing and show slightly. But Pablo, depending on how high up it breaks, if it breaks just on the tip or towards the end of the, of the tusk, it wouldn't hurt because there is no blood right there. But looking at where it break off right towards the, his nasal cavities, that looks like it would have been painful. So it's a similar thing to us when you like clip your nails. If you clip them right at the edge, it's not painful. But if you go deep in more towards the flesh, it becomes slightly painful. So that is why it, it, like the smallest example that I can compare this with right now. But looking at where this particular task break off, it does look like it would have been a painful thing for the big for the poor guy. Elephants are looking and taking their time, and these lines are, look like they're hoping that those elephants move further away from them. What we want to do now, I just want to start, because I think they might not be coming towards us. So we're going to try and find another position and see, just watch this from far so that we don't become part of the problem. I concur. I wouldn't like to become part of the problem either. Good morning, and sorry uh, for my late arrival once again, but we've been chasing leopards all around Pridelands, but we found my favorite animal, and it is one of my favorite herds of elephants too. You can see them all spread out in this open area, feeding on actually lots of sickle bush. Ah, there we go, and you know, Elephants doing handstands and things behind me. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Khat. And like I said, we're here on Pridelands, which is uh, where Eco Training has one of their very many camps. And we're also part of the Baluli Game Reserve and the Greater Kruger National Park. Hello, not Susan. This is not my favorite elephant, but a very curious one. Uh-uh. Stay over there, thank you. Keep your distance. Yeah, what do we smell like this morning? Uh-uh. Don't come too... You don't have to come too close. But what you can't see is that there's the little elephant coming up behind it. Look at the trouble you're starting. You see, that one is also going to probably come here. Hey, girl. You're very relaxed. Very curious. That one's enjoying the scent of that elephant dung, That whether it's come from that same elephant. Sorry, I'm trying to reprimand the little elephant next to me, so I'm waving my hand at it going, no, 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 and trying to narrate 
about what's going on in front of me. What? Don't. We're trying to watch the cute things happen. Now you're disrupting us. Okay, okay. Now she can eat over there. That's fine. Oh, now our little elephant has disappeared, but maybe it will come back around. But this herd has been spending a lot of time in this area, so... Hey, uh-uh. No. Yeah. No. Sorry, I just can't really shout at her from that distance because I'm all the way on the other side of the vehicle. So I just wanted her to know that she can't do that. She mustn't be too cheeky. Again, they're very temperamental at this age. But it is the um, herd of elephants with a female that has a big keyhole shape cut out of her ear. Alicia Key, so it's their breeding herd. Okay, well, we'll sit and spend a bit more time with these elephants and see what else they get up to. Or if you go back across to Barney. So it looks like this elephant was just waiting for us to give him a little bit of space. The minute we started and moved slightly further, he just came right down. He's standing now, one lioness is going flat to the long grass. He's standing at least five meters away from that elephant. I think at any moment, if that elephant takes a step or two, that lioness is going to have to jump off that bush and run for her life. Very quiet out here. Hey? These lions are not making any move whatsoever. And the same thing, this elephant is just standing there staring at them. There is more elephants coming on a distance. So we had two big, big bulls. I don't know if the other two that I'm seeing the heads of from a distance, it's also young bulls that are following these big bulls around. But those youngsters, if they see these lions, they're going to have a little bit more attitude than, than this big bull. So this big bull, of course, is trying to save his energy. It's a little bit more matured. He doesn't have that much energy to run around. Whereas those boys coming from the distance there, they're going to cause some problems when they get here. So these lions must get ready to get out. See, the lions have got the message. They're like, what? Young boys, somebody young and energetic. Let's get out of here before we get smashed. See the difference, how they lie down. Because they realize it's a bigger bull that he might not really worry too much about them. To when now they see the younger bulls coming, they're like, what? Let's get out. Look at how the big guy is looking at them, but for his size, there's no reason for him to feel too threatened. Whereas the young boys will have a little bit more issues with seeing lions for their size. So yeah, Stella, uh, you can rest, rough estimate an elephant's age. Elephants, they are one animal that never stops growing. So they grow the rest of their life. And the second thing, yeah, you can use their size to be able to guess, estimate their age. And you can also use those indentations in front of this elephant's forehead. So looking at the size of this bull and how sunken his indentations are, I will estimate him to be on his late 40s to his 50s. It's really a big, big bull, this. So we'll send you over to go see a bird while we reposition and see what else will happen here. He's still there, same tree. We're just watching... Uh, African Harrier Hawk here has decided that this tree is definitely full of delicious things to eat. Now what's so fascinating to me is that his face is changing all the time from yellow to red to yellow to red. And that I think is in line with excitement. You'll read that they do it during mating but I think it's probably any form of emotional, heightened emotional state. 
by emotional, I just mean kind of um, excitement. So he's searching under every little piece of loose bark on this dead tree. Oh, some beautiful light being cast upon him. See how his face is changing colour all the time. It's quite remarkable. No, I don't think so, Victoria. I don't think there's a correlation between... Well, maybe there's a correlation. I don't know if there's any causation involved. Uh, he's gone, Nils. He's gone off to the right, unfortunately. Correlation between population numbers and monogamy. So, are there... Is monogamy less likely in birds when there are lots of them? Let me think carefully. I'm going to think of non-monogamous birds. Let's well, let's let's go and look at an extremely common bird. So let's look at the red-billed quelea, for example. I'll just have a quick look. See, now quelea's are communal nesting birds, but I don't know if they are. Yes, they're monogamous, so they're completely monogamous. Are red-billed quelea's? Something rare like a martial eagle is completely monogamous. So, no. The answer is no. There doesn't appear to be any obvious correlation between the two. There's definitely no causation. Remember, the big difference between correlation and causation. So, two things can correlate with each other, but they're not necessarily caused by one another. And the reason that I'm making that distinction is that the strategy for survival in the case of monogamy and uh, polygyny in birds, I don't think is related to the number of birds that there are. They're just different ways of, of doing things, and some birds adopt the monogamous pattern for various reasons, and some birds adopt the polygynous pattern for various reasons. Taylor's got a herd of elephants now, so let's go over to her. We still have them. We're not going to go anywhere. But they're just moving in between all the sickle bush. So this, I think at some point, there must have been some kind of farmland around here because there's an obscene amount of sickle bush around here. But they've actually started removing some of it. Um, which would be quite nice. The elephants have done most of the work and have pushed and um, pushed lots of them down, which they've been feeding on. It would kind of be nice if we could do some controlled burning in this area. This would be really amazing. I think we would see an increase in zebra, wildebeest and buffalo moving into in this sort of semi-open area. Elephants, are you enjoying all the sticks today? All the branches? I like that little elephant, how it's resting its back leg as well, just closest to us. Let's just pause for a moment. <laughs> really, really just taking a moment to relax. <laughs> They're always quite humorous when they do things like that, but not moving too far away from mum. She's just up ahead. Now, Don, if we look at this little elephant, although we'll see if it comes out from behind the bushes. Thank you. Um, it, it takes them a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a while. Sorry, I can't English today. Um, to gain control over their trunks, there's so many m big muscles and small muscles uh, that they need to develop. So I'd say by about a year, they've got a fair amount of control over it. But I think it still takes a couple more months after that, you know, to really get the technique right and start perfecting it. You can see this little one is doing quite well. And I can't see any little tusks protruding just yet, so it, it's most likely just over a year old, I would say. It's a bit, yeah, definitely not underneath here. It's quite a tall little elephant. What are you feeding on? Oh, it's just picking some new leaves from some kind of acacia there. Um, 
you know, Shadulu fan, I've read some interesting articles and I've heard a lot of people say that elephants without tusks are more aggressive. I think they, well, I've seen them and they're typically a little bit more temperamental. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, then I've also seen elephants with tusks that have given me a whole lot of, you know, um, sort of drama. When I was down in the Eastern Cape, so southeast coast of South Africa, um, you see a lot of elephants uh, from Addo Elephant pa National Park. Um, there you see so many elephants with no tusks. Uh, they've almost lost that sort of genetic. It's, it's kind of been... Um, bred out of there. Most of the females, in fact, don't even have tusks, or they have one tusk. So, I, I mean, I, I can't say. I haven't seen lots of early cows in this area with no tusks, and I, I can't note, note the the difference. But definitely in the Eastern Cape, the ones down there that were tuskless didn't seem to be so chuffed. I mean, elephants don't necessarily use their tusks to protect themselves. So if you think about it, bulls obviously use their tusks when they're fighting with one another. And, um, and trying to compete for dominance. But if you think of a cow, they use their size. They use, you know, the, just the, the fact that they're in, enormous in, uh, in, in terms of stature to chase away things like lions and they trumpet, they make these big sounds, but they're not like actively running around stabbing things with their tusks. Their tusks are used as a, as a tool. You know, we know they use them for digging, we know they use them for stripping bark off of trees and that type of thing. Obviously, when, if a you know, push comes to shove and they do need to harm someone, and if any of you have ever seen um, elephants being very aggressive, they'll go right down onto their knees and pin things to the ground with their tusks. But, um, I mean, normally just running into a pride alliance will, will chase them away. There's no need to, to use their tusks at all. Oh, that little elephant is is really cute. But I'm yeah, I can't I can't say Shadulu fan that I've noticed a, a particular difference up in the low felt, but definitely in the Eastern Cape. Come, little elephant, you've got a bodyguard you can come walk with, so you feel safe. Here we go. Here comes Mum, sticking close to her. Oh no, now taking the lead. See, look at those little. Agitation signs, ears flared, tails stuck out, but mom's completely relaxed. Mom doesn't mind us. She's smelling us though. You can see how she's twisted her trunk in our direction. Hi, big girl. Little one not too sure of us though. It's taking a wide berth. But here comes its sibling. So maybe the two of them together will be brave enough. Now that's a little elephant. Actually, maybe this other Ellie's a little bit older. Sorry, I just need to talk to uh, to pick up the phone there. Maybe, maybe that elephant's just also not going to get tusks, or it's got very small ones. You can see on the left there. Maybe that one is older than two years. So you see, it's hard. You can never really determine a little one's age just by using uh, its tusks. Now that I've got a nice size comparison between an elephant that's definitely younger than maybe not more than six months old, it's easier to sort of tell the size. But off you go across to Dylan, and it seems as though he's uh, making some kind of dangerous approach. Okay, so we've got, I'm talking softly. We've got something very, very exciting. Hopefully, hopefully, let's keep our fingers crossed. Watch ya. This is gonna be really good.
try this again. Um, just, there was a porcupine sitting just, just inside the entrance there, but it was so dark and he just moved across. So I was really hoping to show you that. Um, super exciting. Um, but now we know that this one's here and I think over the coming days, we're going to start spending some more time at this burrow. It's very, very close to where the meerkats are. Up in that line, it's about 200 meters from the meerkat burrows down to this porcupine burrow. So this could be very, 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 very good for us. Anyway, I was hoping the wind is blowing in the wrong direction. It was worth a try at least. Thank you, Helen. It was super exciting. And like these kind of approaches, like sometimes you win them, sometimes you lose them, but it's always worth trying. And that's the thing. Eh? If you don't try, you're never going to know. But at least we know. And have a look over here, just out of interest. So not nearly as big as that other massive burrow we had, but you can see the porcupine calls over here. Lots and lots of different kinds of calls but we can chat about these when we do a proper porcupine sighting for you. We've managed to catch up with our cheetah family at long last. They've given us quite, quite a tough time. We've been pushing through the thickets, trying to keep up with them. It appeared that, you may remember that when you were last with us, there was a herd of impala just on the other side of the two cubs. Um, and the impalas were staring at the cubs, so there was no way that mom was going to get a chance to hunt them while her cubs were carrying on like that. But she almost seemed to try and loop around to the other side of them, and it seemed to be working. But unfortunately, one of the rams in the impala herd decided that it was a good time to start chasing all the ewes around. And unfortunately, by the time this cheetah had actually got back to the clearing, the impalas were on the other side of the clearing. So she's now laying down to conserve her energy, but the cubs have been giving us an absolute show. They've been chasing each other all over the place, running around in circles, pouncing on each other. They got the attention of the local wildebeest herd and they've now come to lie down again. Emma, you're six years old and you're asking if some cheetah don't have tear marks. Emma, that's a very good question, and to be honest with you, I've never heard of a cheetah without tear marks. I've never seen a picture of a cheetah without tear marks. But I suppose just like with that white lion that you saw with Barney at Angala, I'm sure Barney may have discussed with you how that is due to a due to some um, some well, a difference in the genetics of that lion compared to another lion. I suppose it is possible that somehow with the right genetic changes or the right genetic mutation, which is what's what, what's, what, what it's called when a, a gene doesn't, uh, well, there's a, something strange with the gene, something is not quite right with the gene, and it might change the way an animal looks. So I suppose if the gene that were to be in control of um, causing that tear mark on the cheetah's face, there was some trouble with that gene, then maybe a cheetah would be born without tear marks. But Emma, I've never seen or heard of that happening before. Oh, just listen everybody. There's a very special bird calling in the distance. It might be a bit far for us to hear, but let's just listen. Can you hear that? So apparently it's not not very 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 clear. It is quite far and it is calling from the dense thickets but I would love to show you a photograph of this bird because it is absolutely magnificent. So just while the cubs are, oh that one is moving off but the other one is lying down so I don't think they're going to get up to anything just yet. If they do start to move around we'll go straight back to them. I just want to show you a quick photograph of this bird. It's called a gorgeous bush shrike. And is that not just the most spectacular thing you've ever seen? Look at that olive down on the back and that red throat with a black bib around the bottom of it. And that's the bird that's making that very distinctive call. It 
a, a bird that we hear calling a lot in this area, but we don't get to see very often because, oh, go back, the cubs, cubs are chasing each other. Look at this. Just in the flash of an eye, or the blink of an eye rather. Oh, they found a bit of dung there, it looks like. Oh, they're just so playful. It's so good to see them running around like this. So sorry, coming back to the gorgeous bush rock, a bird that we hear often but don't get to see because of its very shy nature. But maybe one day we'll be able to get one on camera. <laughs> These cubs are running laps around this bush. And mum just letting her kids have fun. Practice their, their sprinting skills, training those muscles. I think we're going to spend maybe a few more minutes with this cheetah, everyone. And because I'm still hopeful that she is going to try and hunt again. We still are in an area where there are a lot of animals around. And so maybe when you come back, she'll have found some impala. And maybe... That one guy walking towards them. Now they're taking their time, slowly moving towards the same water hole where those lions had a drink earlier on today. So we came around to the front and we're standing by, that's why we're keeping a little bit of a distance so that we don't disturb them. We're standing by to watch them come down to come have a drink in this same water hole. It looks like this water hole has been popular from this morning, starting with the lions, now with the elephants. It might be slightly difficult for the other species with the lions being where they are. So we're going to stick around and see how long it's going to take these guys. They are not in any hurry at all. They walking and stopping and feed and slowly but surely coming towards this water hole. So it looks like they need to get down here at some stage for their early morning drink. However, Ash, those dents, they in called indentations in front of their foreheads. The ones that have got, if you see those ones that are too sunken in and they look big, it's, it shows the age of an actual animal. So sometimes it happens to humans too when they're really old, you start seeing that on their forehead on the sides of their heads. If you look at the young elephants standing on either side of those two big bulls, if you look at their indentations, they don't have their indentations, they're not as sunken as those two big bulls. How majestic is the picture of those two big bulls together, side to side like that. They look like kite wise, they're exactly the same size, and their indentations are equally as sunken. So I think the age difference between the two of them is not that great. And I think, if anything, they might even have the same age. Mm -hmm. So you see how they walk, it looks like they've got the youngsters bodyguarding them. How the youngsters are walking on either side and the two big guys are walking right in the center. And they're really, really taking their time to get to this water hole. We just need one of them to take the lead and come down and the rest of them are going to start coming quickly. But right now they don't look like they are in a hurry to get to this water hole at all. Luckily we have time. We're going to wait with them while they do that and see how long it takes them. So if you look on the two young elephant bulls as well, the smaller, the smaller one to the right next to the edge of the water, also only have one task.
Judge, the elephant's trunk is the strongest tool they have. Yeah, I think it's so powerful and it can bend in all different direction and it can suck water. They reckon there is up to about 50,000 different muscle components into that trunk that makes it to be able to do all the different things that it can do. That is possibly one of the strongest tools that the elephant has. Without the trunk, they won't be able to feed, breathe properly, or actually even dig things on the ground. So as much as sometimes they use the task to soften the ground, they need that trunk to get involved by scooping the sand off and take it out of what they're trying to dig. So that is by far the most powerful tool that they have for sure. Look at how the big bull has extended this trunk and it's kind of resting it on the ground. It makes it look like the trunk might be slightly heavy, that every now and again it feels like it needs a little bit of a break from carrying it around and just make it lie on the ground like that. Take your time, boys. So this is quite a beautiful scene here, beautiful open area, nice water hole, and these four elephants coming down. Look like they just chose each other, two big ones, two small ones, enjoying each other's company. It is strange indeed, it makes you wonder what might have happened there. But what sometimes happens with elephants and their task is that they are like us, sometimes they're either left-handed or right-handed. So unless they broke these tusks in a fight, it means that the bigger elephant and the smaller one, that they might or both have been left tasked because they might have been using those left tusks to dig for things. That might be how they break them. However, it could be completely different if it means that one break it on a fight and the other one break it trying to dig stuff down. So Claudia, they would have had elephant smell from further up. But remember from this morning, the site where the elephants are coming from now, this is not the site where the lions drink. The dry lions drank coming from the other side of the water hole, where the elephants didn't want to go down that side because it's much, much steep and it's full of rocks. And I think that might have been slightly comfortable to try and stop this big body from sliding down from that steep valley. And also, elephants don't really like too much stepping on top of the rocks because somehow I think those rocks might hurt a little bit onto the elephant's legs. So they came completely onto the opposite side. So this side, there wouldn't be any lion's smell. However, this does goes to show, remember this morning when we came with the lions, how they also stopped and investigated and looked around. I think the same thing the elephants are doing, just checking things out and making sure that there is nothing else that might bother them. Not like there is too many stuff that is there to bother elephants, but it's still quite a good habit from their side to keep, just making sure who has been here, who might be here, before they literally go all the way down to drink. Now I have to say, this is the smallest termite mound I have ever seen a dwarf mongoose use. It's actually quite comical. There's only one, I imagine the rest of the gang will be somewhere around. <laughs> but this, well, it's tiny, it looks new. You can tell by the sort of freshness and dampness of the mound. <laughs> it's a relatively new termite mount. And this chubby guy appears to the on be the only one in the mount. Where is everybody?
Now, I just want to give you a quick update on what I've been doing. So we went for a little bumble and came across fresh leopard ash tracks, as you know. And when we followed them, they actually go east along one of the roads that James drove earlier and they weren't there. So yes, what that means is from the period of time that James drove the road to the time that I drove the road, a leopard walked that road. So we tried and we tried and we looped and we looped. No such luck. James is also working on it and we are heading back to the den. Beverly, I agree. Dwarf mongoose in general are so adorable. Oh! Off he goes. He was a very chunky mongoose. Heavy set, shall we say. Got his winter winter suit on. Let me just see if we can go forward. I actually don't think he was using that mound. I think he was just having a little investigation of it. Have we disappeared? I think he has. So the hyena den is just up here. That's exactly where I'm headed. It always amazes me as to how delicate elephants really are. And I feel like this elephant is giving us a great example about how she's resting her foot just on the branch. She's, you know, and they're just such enormous creatures. And if she wanted to, she could crack and crush that branch. But instead, she's just very gently resting it there. Oh, and down again. Maybe she heard me. It's so amazing to sit and watch them and just listen to them move around. There's almost no sound. And they've been very quiet. They haven't been vocalizing much. There's been no young elephants throwing tantrums that have been wanting to suckle. But these two up in front have been entertaining one another. They've been playing a fair amount. The little one keeps trying to climb onto the back of the bigger elephant on the right hand side, which as you can imagine, with the size difference, is virtually impossible. But it's been humorous nonetheless and now they're just just feeding again it's very 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 peaceful it was also interesting the other day with the wild dogs running through i think they definitely were the ones that set up uh, unsettled the elephants for quite some time and now they've gone back to being much more relaxed because for a few days we couldn't work out why they were so startled but then the wild dogs arrived so i wondered if they had anything to do with it um Andrew, so with elephants, it sort of depends on uh, their their sex or, you know, so if they're male or female. And that will determine how long they're going to stay with their mother for. Because if it's a female being a matriarchal-based uh, society, she'll probably stay in the herd for her whole life. And, and she'll never lose that bond between her mother and... Oh, sorry, off you go across the cheetahs are on the move. Welcome back everybody. We have followed this female cheetah into this open clearing and the herd of impala is coming back. They've moved back across the clearing from where they were chased to by the ram and look at how this mother cheetah is starting to stalk again. Now where she currently is, see that bush in front of her and then a couple of bushes off to the right as well. So we once again find ourselves in this incredibly tense situation where she's got a lot of ground to cover to get to those impala. But for the time being, it seems like, I'm just looking through my binoculars, none of them have lifted their heads yet. They're all grazing and they're all facing into the wind. Everyone. The wind is kind of blowing across from the right. And so often herbivores, when they feed, they'll feed into the wind to make sure they can smell anything that's coming at them from up ahead and this cheetah look at how she's using the thickets there one of the impalas is, has just lifted its head but it's not it hasn't looked at her she's got quite a bit of ground to cover still everyone and we might we might lose sight of her i'm just going to warn you all but we're not going to be able to move unfortunately because if we do move from here just us starting the engine might cause an impala to lift its head and look in our direction so we're going to sit nice and still, but she's advancing everybody, she's making good progress, she's moving, she's got so much cover for now. 
There's a lot of low growing thorn bushes there that she can that she can move move between. She's also stalking with the sun at her back, and so that might that might help her a little bit. Imagine for those impala, every time they lift their head, they've got the and they look in this direction, they've got the glare of the sun in their eyes. So that might help her a little bit. Andrew, you're asking what the main diet of a cheetah is. And Andrew, it will depend on whether it's a male coalition, a coalition of brothers, um, a female, a female with cubs, and it will depend on the area too. So Andrew, in this case, with this female cheetah, and on our reserve and in the regions that she has been moving around in in the last few weeks, Andrew, she mainly has been feeding on Impala uh, and Nyala and Grey Dacre. Uh, also red dacre, they are, if she does hunt in slightly thicker bush. Um, so small, smaller antelope, Andrew. Um, she might, if she's lucky, uh, it's the wrong time of the year, but later on in the year when the wildebeest start to give birth, she might hunt wildebeest calves. Oh, and she is, she, oh, she looks so exposed now. But amazingly, those Impala don't seem to have seen her. Like, there's one that's, that is looking in her direction, but it doesn't seem to be concerned. It's, it's currently chewing. And typically an Impala that's, that's chewing is an Impala that's relatively relaxed. But look at how she's frozen now. It's just like we were saying yesterday, whenever they are looking in her direction, she freezes. As soon as they drop their head, she carries on stalking. But there's that one Impala that... I think has had its suspicions aroused. It's not concerned yet, but it is looking in her direction. Oh, and yesterday, remember yesterday when those cubs, they false started and they ran too early, thinking they would come and join their mother. And they have been inching forward towards her. They were initially sitting very well concealed behind a bush, but they're now quite exposed as well. She's moving forward again, ever so slowly. Oh, this is so tense. So we've watched her now, how many times in the last, in the last few days together? We've watched her try and hunt, or we've watched her chase twice. And if she does chase now, This is so exciting. This is, this is exactly why we wanted to come here again this morning, everybody. It was for, for the chance to watch this. The chance to watch her try and hunt again. And just the clearing that she's in. Return trip, you're asking if cheetah can sneak really low along the ground like leopards do. Return trip they can, but it's not something that they typically do too much of when they stalk. They tend to kind of, just typical behavior, they tend to walk with their head down and they don't typically bend their, le or they don't squat down as low as a leopard will. They don't kind of crawl like that as much as a leopard does typically. If the cover was very sparse, she might, she might do that. But I haven't seen that happen very often with cheetah. Oh, she's moving ever closer to those impala, everyone. And I'm just watching through my binoculars, looking to see if if they have spotted her. And again, that one that was looking in her direction is still chewing. So I don't think it's I don't think it's noticed her just yet. But like I was saying, look at how open this clearing is, everyone. If she runs. I think we've got the perfect spot to watch from here. If the Impala run left, we'll be able to watch them run across the clearing. If they run right, which is again, unfortunately, I think what they, they might do. Now they'll know that, they'll know that she needs to use her speed to catch up with them. And they'll know that if they can get into that very dense bush to the right, that they will have a chance, a better chance of escaping from her. And so if she does decide to chase, I'm thinking that that's where they might go. 
Oh, but she's getting into that thorn bush now, everybody. That's exactly... That's good for her. She'll have good cover in there. It'll be hard for those impala to spot her. The wind has shifted direction as well, everybody. It's now coming not so much from the west, coming more from the northwest. So coming over our shoulder. And it's going to be blowing from her to those to those impala on the far left that are in amongst the wildebeest. Oh, and it's just so tense. She obviously needs this hunt to, to feed herself and to feed her little ones. But of course the impala that she selects, of course, needs to live, so... Everything is hanging or balancing precariously. Susan, you're asking how long a cheetah hunt normally takes? Susan, it will depend on well, the actual whole process of the hunt. So the spotting of the prey, the, pre the cheetah analyzing or selecting her, her choice of prey within that group, and then the stalk and the chase, it depends. Sometimes like this, I mean, she's been stalking these impala now for probably about close to 10 minutes. And there could be still a long time now between when she actually decides to, or when she actually decides to, to, to progress forward and when she actually starts to run. So soon as it's very hard to give an exact figure because it very much depends on the, on the terrain. Sometimes if a cheetah, I mean, it's possible that a cheetah is lying behind a bush and something stumbles out in front of her and she jumps up and grabs it. And then, I mean, it would have taken a matter of seconds, but like this, it could, oh, what happened? Oh no. What happened? Oh no, everybody. It looked like a bird flushed out of the grass next to her and she got a fright. <laughs> oh, shame. <laughs> shame. And then look at her, her, did you see how her tail flicked in the air? And immediately those impala saw, oh my goodness, there's a cheetah here. And they ran away. But here she comes running straight back, coming to look for her cubs. Game over. Oh man, that was exciting. Oh, the heart rates are back up again. Okay, again we're going to need to <laughs> to relax a little bit after all of that. So let's go and have a look at a squirrel with James. Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. Well, certainly more calming than watching a cheetah hunt. I suppose those cheetahs have really delivered for us over the last couple of days. Let's hope they continue to do so this afternoon. I have uh, not managed to deliver much to today. Our leopard tracks, Lauren did refind the leopard tracks. We both had a go around here. I've been in on foot. I can't find anything. Anyway, that's the way it goes with leopard looking, really. And now we've got a squirrel, where I thought I heard some birds alarm calling. But I think that if there was a leopard around here, the squirrel would be going off its head. I always wanted to see a leopard in this tree or on the base of the termite mound because it's such a magnificent tambuti tree growing out of a termite terrier. I think this little thing is just hoping that the sun's going to come out again and warm him up a bit. Unfortunately, it is still quite sort of frontal weather at the moment. You can almost feel him willing the sun to come out. It was out on him to start with. 
And I don't know where all his, all his friends are because there are lots of squirrels that live in this tree. Maybe they're all foraging already. Maybe he's just a late starter. It's also not that cold this morning, so he shouldn't be too freezing. The cloud cover has one advantage, and that is that it just didn't get down to the wintry temperatures we've been used to of late. Now, somewhere where it's much colder and where the desire for the sun is equally as strong is the Kalahari. <sighs> So finally, in the dying minutes of the game, these meerkats have decided to come out. And um, we've just got back from where the porcupines are, and on our approach up, we had a clear view of these burrows. There was absolutely no sign of them. And as we're putting the equipment down, the first little one popped out in that now. So the temperature's picking up a little bit, but the wind is still blowing strongly out of the northeast, southwesterly, and um, yeah. It's not the warmest day that we've had, um, but I'm actually glad that these little ones are out. I don't think there'll be any sign of the pups today, unfortunately. And hey, I'm only wrong by a week. I said they'll probably be out in about two weeks' time after being born. Well, we're on week three. <laughs> I'll be right at some point. I am, on a serious note though, I am very very worried about this big cold front coming in um, as long as these pups stay underground I'd be super happy if they actually just stay tucked well down these burrows over the coming let's say this coming week just because this cold front is going to be nasty by all accounts and it's not going to be good for them Javiet has just asked how strong can the wind get at Swalu. We've we've recorded 90 kilometer hour winds here. Um, and that's and that's not even I mean that, that those were really strong winds obviously. Um, but yeah gale force winds no it, it's absolutely standard to get that occasionally in winter. It's not like the normal wake up in the morning you got gale force winds howling across here and that. But certainly cut flying weather <laughs> common. This is actually really good cut flying weather. I was saying to Jondo, maybe tomorrow morning we should bring some kites out. I don't know where we're going to get a kite from. But um, as you can see, these meerkats just popped down again. They are not, really not liking this weather. They're like up, check around, down again. No, but the wind blows out here. And that's, they, they, some, so it really benefits some animals. You know, some animals can hunt really well with wind. We, we watched that cheetah hunting actively the other day very clearly using wind to do that um, and then but then other things it just becomes a real bind like these poor little guys yeah I mean they're, they're small body size losing heat they got to get out got to get enough energy and it's, uh, it, it's like, uh, you see when that meerkat looks up it was watching the birds fly over that's brilliant so but I think John and I we're going to stick this out um, even with this wind and in the meantime head over to the cheetah and see what that cheetah's up to The family has managed to regroup after mum's attempt at hunting. The wind is now absolutely pumping from the northwest. And mum and her youngsters taking some time to relax, let everything calm down in this clearing again. And I wonder if maybe a little bit later, once those impala have settled down a bit, if this mother cheetah might not try again. I was actually just, we were, my son and I were just chatting now, we were watching that herd of impala as they kind of came back to the patch they were feeding on before they got frightened by this cheetah and there's one particular impala in there that has quite a bad limp. So I wonder if it didn't maybe take or put a foot wrong while it was trying to run away during a previous chase. Maybe sometime last night or sometime yesterday. 
And that may well have been the impala that she had honed in on and that she had planned to try and catch. Phoenix, you asking about the tear marks or the black lines under the cheetah's eyes and you're asking if they help the cheetah to see far. So Phoenix, what scientists believe is that those black lines, because those dark colors attract light and they can almost act like a bit of a, like a pair of sunglasses, and help to reduce the glare going into a cheetah's eyes. So yes, they help to reduce glare and I suppose that would help them then to see very far. If they were in an open plane like this and the sun was overhead and the sun was very bright and very intense, then it would definitely help them to scan their surroundings for potential prey. Yeah, and with that being said, I think as the day goes on, this cheetah is definitely going to try and hunt again a little bit later. She'll use the bright sunlight and the heat of the day to her advantage, knowing that the chances of having a lion or a hyena or a leopard disrupt her on their carcass if she's successful is a bit less in the middle of the day. Layla Grace, you're asking when these cubs will be able to run as fast as their mother. Layla Grace, probably only when they're about getting close to independence. So probably at about 18 months old, one and a half years. Um, that's when they'll be able to, they'll be f fully grown and, or maybe not the, in the case of the male, but they'll be getting to, to full size and that's probably when they'll be able to, to keep up with her. But for the time being, all they can, oh, they're not nearly as fast as she is. It sounds like we've had a fantastic morning though, across all the properties at Wild Earth. And I don't know, we've had a fantastic morning following these cheetah around and who knows what the afternoon will bring. Of course, this afternoon we'll be going live once again for the Sunset Safari at 3 p.m. South African time. And who knows what that will bring. Looking forward to seeing you all this afternoon.